Hey, welcome back to Past Gas, everybody. This week we are talking Saab. It's part one of two of our series on Saab. We're going to be talking about their origins. Yeah, born from jets. Uh, then they moved on to the small commuter cars. You know, this episode spans from like World War II to the 80s. And then next time we'll talk about 90s to the brand's eventual death. But how... You know, where'd the brand get its start? What kind of rich guys started this company? Yeah. With what kind of money? Did they collaborate with Nazis? Hopefully not. They did, though. <laughs> and why does James look so weird this week? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Pass Gas. It's a beautiful sunny day, and you're having the time of your life piloting a fun hatchback on a winding road. Oh. The engine's got low-end torque, so accelerating out of small, technical corners is a piece of cake. But what you're driving isn't a modern Volkswagen GTI or Hyundai Veloster N. No, this turbocharged four-cylinder sport compact predates them all. This is the 1978 Saab 99 Turbo. And it's not only the world's first turbocharged sport compact, but it represents what made Saab so great. Innovation, safety, and efficiency. The story of Saab is one of out-of-the-box thinking. This Swedish brand barely made it past its 70th birthday before it died, but the legacy it built throughout those decades made it something truly special. But what made Saab such a legend in all things detail-oriented and quirky? What were some of the most legendary and popular models, and what made them so fun to drive? And finally, why did the brand die out in the early 2010s? Well, this week on Pass Gas, it's part one of our two-part story on Saab. Big thanks to Liquid IV for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. However you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code GAS at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code GAS at liquidiv.com. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. Listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash Past Gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash Past Gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash Past Gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. I hope I live to be 70. 70. Before I die out. That's interesting because a couple weeks ago you said you didn't want to live past 2018. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now I know better. Now I'm, you know, 70s. I didn't know what the future held for me, but... 70 I, like, seems pretty young. Yeah, 70 is pretty hope. young. But I'm just saying I would be lucky to live to 70. Anything after that is borrowed time. Ooh. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I've, that we're going to live to be like 120. Really? Oh, I don't want to live that long. Oh, uh, well, maybe the microplastics. I don't know. We'll have, have to see. Have you seen these people are making like AI pictures of people celebrating their 120th birthday and writing captions as if they were the person like, I just turned 120 today. I made myself a peach and cream cake. <laughs> and all these boomers are like, wow, God bless you. <laughs> 120 just seems, I don't know. Like once you're past, I want to say 95. Yeah. You're not move. You're not very mobile, unless like you're one of those uh, people you see on the news where it's like she's 97 and still running marathons, yeah. and you're like, yeah. How do you find the time? My grandpa <laughs> skied into his 90s. Oh wow! But Whoa. he he passed at 94, and his wife passed at 100. Whoa! Uh, so my you, other, you my could other lived at 120. Oh, barring any unforeseen circumstances that you know, life mass shooting. Yeah, if you're confused. <laughs> If you're confused why James sounds so feminine today, it's because Christina, our producer, is sitting in because James is sick. Yes. And he's normally not sick, so he must That's be That's what I was like, like, whoa, never it's been a while. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, welcome to Past Gas, everybody. My name is Nolan Sykes. Joined not as always. Well, yeah, technically as always. I'm always scenes. here. You've Christina's heard always me. here. Christina Felsky sitting across from me. Say hello. To hello. 
I'm oh. a little, I'm a little sexy frog. <laughs> She's a sexy frog today. Nice. That's a good um, catchphrase. <laughs> that is a good catchphrase. Uh, yeah. And of course, Joe Weber. Oh, what's up? Keep it juiced. Keep it juiced. Uh, I actually have to keep it juiced, but I forgot my lotion today because I got a new tattoo. That's where that comes oh. from. If you were confused, uh, we talked about tattoos like four years ago. Yeah. And I told James he's got to keep it juiced or else it'll scab up. And that became my catchphrase. I actually didn't, I didn't know that. Know wow. that. Wow. That's some serious lore. Yeah. I thought it was like, keep it charged up. Yeah. It works on so many levels. On. That's why I kept yeah. saying it's it. It's great. Yeah. yeah. Really good. I'll say it on the on the way in today. He goes, Oh, I forgot to juice it up. And I was like, what the Yeah. <laughs> I said that I said that something like that to the tattoo artist, and she was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I just like that you're inventing uh, you know, words that no one knows what yeah. you're really talking about. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a really nice quality. And just but what tattoo did you know. get, Joe? Tell the listener. Oh, I yeah. got this artichoke. Well, I wore the wrong shirt to yeah, show it off today, but this artichoke. is a reason to watch it, our podcast on YouTube. And also follow Help. Joe on social media. It's um, on story. It's a little artichoke. Dude, so I love cute. It. Yeah, I've been talking about getting an artichoke for a while because I wanted a food tattoo too, because I love food and I cooked forever. So I was like, I don't want to get the fork and yeah. knife crossbones. Yeah. Uh, the babish. <laughs> that's what he. Babish. Yeah, he has yeah, shirts. You don't want to fish on your middle finger. That's one too. I don't know. It'd be kind of fun. That, uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's a thing. I'm waiting to get. This hand is my tattoos. keep it juice. I have to get. <laughs> <laughs> I have to like really choose the right tattoos for my hands. So. Yeah. I'm waiting on those. Hmm. No one, when are you going to get your first tattoo? I don't know. I've I've been kind of putting it off. I don't have any tattoos, obviously. Get one, dude. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I if know. you want to email us, passgas at donutmedia.com, tell us what well, tattoo Noel yeah. we should get. Give us some ideas. Yeah, yeah we'll was, read them on air and oh we'll pick God. the right one. When yeah. I was, this Can is so embarrassing. <laughs> In my freshman year of college, when I was living in Flagstaff, there's a lot of good tattoo shops over there. So I like wanted to get something. Yeah. And my first idea was like getting like a bunch of like Mastodon tattoos, the bands, because oh, I was like, was and still am very into them. And I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't do that. Yeah. You know, don't get a band tattoo because like one member says something weird and then yeah. like you don't, you're embarrassed for the rest That's of your true. life. Yeah. Yeah. See, growing up, I really loved Alkaline Trio, yeah. the band, and they have a song, Clavicle. Uh -huh. And so I wanted to get Clavicle written on uh, my clavicle, uh -huh. which as I get older, I think is a better and better idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have the opposite experience. It seems experience. like a, it would hurt a lot. Yeah. That's not a concern. Yeah. I don't know. I, I feel like that's such a temporary thing. It's more that I'm like, is this stupid? And again, as I get older, I'm like, I think it's funnier and funnier. And it's Pain like, is temporary. Clavicle is forever. Clav Clavicle <laughs> is forever. It's a good song. Yeah. Well, you don't want to get a tattoo that you're going to regret because that's a huge sob story. It is. <laughs> it is, Joe. But you know what else? <laughs> it's a sob story. Yeah. <laughs> the story of sob. It's a sob story. Sorry, I was sitting on that for a while. <laughs> I think... I think we're all like waiting, like when's the best time to employ that <laughs> level one pun? In this That's episode. an entry level pun. Yeah. If you stick around, you'll get to four and five, maybe. Or level nine, nine. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's level two right there. <laughs> all right, let's talk about Saab. Saab, spelled S A A B, has a fascinating history. But first, we got to take it back to Sweden in 1945 to talk about their humble off-road beginnings. I'm not talking Froden, Overlanden. We're You're literally the talking off the road. The marketing adage, born from jets, gets mentioned quite a bit when Saab's part of the discussion, especially if you're old enough to remember the brand's marketing throughout the 90s and 2000s. Those were some great commercials. But Born From Jets was not just a marketing gimmick. Saab isn't some person's name or town. It's an acronym for Svenska Aeroplan Aktibolaget. <laughs> That's how it's spelled. Aktibolaget, or Swedish Plane Company in English. Swedish Plane Company? That's... <laughs> <laughs> Saab was founded in 1937 in Trollhattan, Sweden. That's like Manhattan, but it's <laughs> full of trolls. It's all for trolls. <laughs> so uh -oh. many riddles in that the town. The new Trolls yeah. movie, Trolls yeah. Go to Trollhattan, dude. Yeah. Look, I'm just trying to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> yes, but what is the origin? <laughs> Answer me these riddles three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the company was founded by Marcus Wallenberg Jr., <laughs> Axel Vena Gren and Sven Gustav Vinquist. Oh. Mm -hmm. Nice. 
That's a good name for like a plain guy. Yeah. It is, yeah. Wallenberg was an industrialist with a resume thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, his family name. <laughs> for the record, that's not what the writer wrote. No, no. <laughs> but thicker I than the dictionary? More. No, thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. Thicker is than a dictionary crucial. is also pretty funny, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the left turn, the left turn is both Joe and I are reading it. Yeah, yeah. This is why, yeah. First and foremost, uh, Wallenberg's family name means quite a lot in Sweden. His relatives populated Swedish brands, banks, and government offices. Think Scandinavian Airlines, Ericsson, and Sweden's foreign diplomacy, political parties, and so on. And thanks to this lineage, Wallenberg was born in 1899 and lived a very successful life that revolved around bolstering the Swedish economy. <laughs> Me too. I live my life around bolstering, bolstering the, the Swedish, Swedish economy. economy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're doing just doing, No, they're doing, doing fine. fine. Yeah. But it's not because of me. Oh, okay. However, Wallenberg and his family had their share of shady dealings as well. The Wallenberg-owned SEB bank collaborated with the Nazis during World War II by laundering their money, concealing investments, and other unscrupulous practices. Though, on the plus side, family member Raoul Wallenberg was a Swedish diplomat and is credited with saving the lives of tens of thousands of Hungarian Jews during the war. So, silver lining there, yeah. I guess. He sold his carbon credits, too. <laughs> The rest of the family. Axel Venergren was an entrepreneur who helped make vacuum cleaners the household products they are today. But before that, he was born in 1881 to a wealthy family that owned a timber farm. After receiving an education in Sweden, Germany, and the U.S., his interests were of the sales and venture capital flavor, including convincing the Swedish company Electro to buy the patent to the vacuum cleaner. He used his massive wealth to amass ownership in media, banks, and other manufacturing industries, Unfortunately, like his business partner, Venergren also had some shady dealings with the Nazis both before and during World War II. Usually so. it's like four pages of the script before we get into like the Nazi dealings, but I'm glad we're getting it out right of the way. way. Yeah. You got to know. Yeah. Now, I have a question for you guys. I obviously edited this script, so yeah. I <laughs> know this story. Uh, <laughs> uh, but humble you, brag. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Uh, but do you guys think that the third person also dealt with the Nazis or not? I'm going to say Vinkvist. Yes. Vinkvist. <laughs> Do you think Vinkvist dealt with the Nazis? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to say yeah. Well, this was anticlimactic. Let's go. <laughs> Sven Gustav Vinkvist was a ball bearing impressi <laughs> <laughs> impresario. Who fact, isn't? I mean, these days, you know? Yeah. In fact, we can thank Sven for the smooth transfer of energy across manufacturing, transportation, and beyond. He invented the multi row self aligning ball bearing in 1907. Oh, thank you for my skateboard bearings, Sven. I have, to, I have to know what this is. You haven't Googled something in a really long time. So this is kind of exciting. I'm pretty well, sure it's know just what... a ball bearing with like a groove in the oh, yeah, housing of it. It is. Yeah. 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 Simple but effective. Mm. <laughs> These are most used in agricultural machinery, conveyor belts and manufacturing and other very common yet very important applications. Like Unfortunately, skateboard. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, Sven also dabbled in dealings with the Nazis. <laughs> the ball bearing company he founded SKF uh, had 60% of its production located in Germany until late world war two. Dang. SKF still around. Jumping back into the combined capitalist effort, uh, these three joined forces as they saw the bright future in aeronautics. And why not utilize their backgrounds to capitalize on it? You know? Why not? Yeah. Why not use their Nazi ties to <laughs> yeah. dominate the landscape? <laughs> they all put their hands on Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> the company was essentially a member of Sweden's defense industry. It built warplanes, okay? When we said off-road earlier, I meant up in the air, not on the trails. Oh, that was the twist. Yeah. yeah. You Shyamalan these. That was a level. <laughs> that was level two pun. You might say. Oh yeah. <laughs> Even though Sweden was a neutral nation, it still needed a surplus of military vehicles of all sorts in case its neutrality was violated by any of the warring powers. One of the first planes these guys built was on license. It was the German original Junkers U eighty six. However, once World War II broke out and Sweden either couldn't obtain warplanes or license them from other nations. It went to work coming up with its own domestically designed and built birds. 
Uh, a sidebar on this, one of Saab's early claims to fame was designing and building ejection seats, as they are today, rockets that shoot you out of damaged and destined to crashed fighter planes. Mm -hmm. You know, people sometimes like break their back. The force is so that makes intense sense. of shooting you up in the air. Damn. Yeah. So imagine like how intense that moment would be. Like you, you're shot, you're playing, your engine's going down. You have to eject at the last second. And yeah. then just like explosion, you break your back and then you still have to like float down and land yeah. on the Man. ground. It's and you know crazy. What, you know what the hardest part of that is? What? If you land in troll Hatton. Oh yeah. <laughs> they're going to come after you and make like, you sick. Dude, the doctor, the hospital, they're it's like, like oh, we don't need this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then there's slime everywhere. Yeah. Slime? Yeah, yeah trolls are all slimy. They also don't take insurance there. I feel like we all have different <laughs> ideas of what trolls are. <laughs> <laughs> I just watched uh, Lord of the Rings, so a troll oh. to me is like a big oh, slimy yeah. dude. Okay. Mm, I'm thinking I, under the bridge. I'm thinking bridge troll. I'm thinking... Dancing, singing, big oh, hair, little hairy guys. That's like Broadway in Troll Hat. Yeah. I'm thinking of like <laughs> the Bowery, like okay. Red Hook district. Yeah. I'm thinking like there's loot players. <laughs> like so skip it a lot, you yeah. know what yeah. I mean? Okay. Like we're doing medieval troll. Yeah. This says a lot about our personalities. I know, I was going to say it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I, I was like bridge troll. But, <laughs> yeah. Big thanks to BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode of Pass Gas. A lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. The question is, time for what? If time was unlimited, how would you use it? The best way to squeeze that special thing in your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make it a priority. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. I think therapy is super important for everyone. I don't think anyone has all their stuff figured out. And I think BetterHelp is the best way to get into therapy if you've never done it before. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash passgas today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash passgas. Thanks, BetterHelp. Saab was a successful operation during the war. However, post-war presented a problem. Swedish fighter planes weren't in demand, domestically or elsewhere, but passenger vehicles were. So, at the end of the war, manufacturing went through a period of transition from defense to normal consumer products. We talk about this in so many episodes. Yeah. Uh, it's almost like the Second World War was a big deal or something. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, Can't wait for the third. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really dark today, wow. Christina. Warhawk, Christina. I'm under a bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Between the U.S. and Europe, everybody needed time to adjust to produce cars instead of tanks. Europe especially, as it needed to rebuild in general after over five years of intense war. Meanwhile, Volvo's like, let's just make these cars tanks. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Also a Swedish company. Mm -hmm. Did we do an episode on Volvo? No, we haven't yet. It's actually on the list. Nice. If we should or not... Again, let us know. Yeah, let us know by going to YouTube and clicking like on this video. And writing nice comments about us and what you like about all of us. Yeah, only <laughs> nice comments. <laughs> we will only accept compliments or we won't. <laughs> we won't I won't take your suggestion. <laughs> Saab Automobile was formed in 1945 to capitalize on the need for passenger vehicles, especially inexpensive ones. Its first production model hit the market in 1947. The Ur Saab 92.001. Oh, wow. <laughs> or the first Saab 92 for short. And short it was. A teeny little metallic oh, wow. raindrop. It's like a little teardrop. Yeah, like you just said. That thing's Whoa. so cute. It's so cute. Dude, I bet that thing would. This be is like quick. BMW I said of vibes. If you put a really gnarly motor in that thing, you took it to Bonneville. That's funny. That's, a, that's aerodynamic. Yeah. Ooh. Mm. Cover that thing with salt. Mm. Here's the thing, though. Saab's background was in aerodynamics and other plane technology, so the 92 showed it. And since Saab never made an automobile before, it was using its know-how from planes to engineer cars as best as it could. The 92's sleek shape made it cut through the air better like a plane, which meant it could make the most out of its tiny two-stroke, two-cylinder engine that made 25 horsepower. That's right, just 25, and like a dirt bike or snowblower, it consumed oil to function properly. So. For anyone who doesn't know, two strokes, you have to mix the oil and the gas together. 
we did that when we went dirt biking with Jerry, mm-hmm. and that was the first time I had seen that before. I'd never even mm-hmm. ridden a two stroke before, but man, that thing rips. And I think twenty five horsepower for that little vehicle is not too bad out of a two cylinder engine. Yeah, yeah. right for the time. Yeah, it's probably super light. It's probably nine hundred pounds. It's probably, maybe so, not. Maybe not. I don't know. No one will ever it. know. <laughs> I can lift it. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. If I use my knees, not my back, 100% yeah, could sure. lift it. Yeah, I you lock it. your knees, you shoot <laughs> straight up, and you bend at the waist. Bend at the waist. Yeah. All your power is in your lower back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys can't see this because I'm sitting in a chair, but my lower back is yoked. <laughs> oh, she's, got, she's got abs on her back. It's, yeah. Unsettling, actually. Vascular. I'm, I'm studying <laughs> at university. Vascular back. <laughs> my back is vascular. My vascular back. But boy, was the 92 utilitarian. All early models were painted green since it was <laughs> left over from wartime. I mean, why not save money and stick out? Besides old Jags, not a whole lot else from the era came in green. Then it had suicide doors to easily get in and out. Nicely tuned suspension for the era that rode well over rough roads and front-wheel drive for good traction. This is especially useful in climates that see lots of snow like Sweden. Hmm. So this makes sense if you're trying to make a cheap car. You make it front-wheel drive because you don't need extra shafts. Uh, yeah. You can put it longitudinal. You can mount it longitudinally. Yeah. It makes more space in the passenger cabin. Yeah. Um, very economical uh, engine-wise. Yeah. Yeah. When a slightly revised 92 debuted in 1950, it had some thoroughly cool driving enthusiasm behind it. Swedish slash Norwegian rally racer Greta Melander raced in the 1950 Rally Monte Carlo behind the wheel of a 92. Very cool. Greta was not only a world renowned pro driver, but a Hollywood stunt woman and a travel writer. What? That sounds like an awesome resume. Yeah. You can just You've, do whatever back yeah. then. Yeah. I mean, do we need Race to do car that? Driver, on her? Greta Melander. It's like I'm a it's like what do you do? I'm a race car driver, stunt woman and travel writer. Yeah. Before her time behind the wheel of sobs, though a series of unfortunate circumstances with losing her family inheritance and having learned to drive at a very young age, which was rare for women back then, she got into motorsports to earn money. Hmm. She Usually raced it's a, the other way around. Yeah. To lose so like, money. Yeah. To <laughs> uh, support your addiction. She raced a borrowed Plymouth in rally throughout the 1930s, including five wins at Monte Carlo. That's cool. Well before her success in the Saab 92. In the Saab, she earned second place out of 11 in the women's class and 55th place out of 135 finishers. That's crazy. The next year, she won it. Wow. Three years later, she won the entire World Rally Championship in her class. Wow. You love to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Saab chief engineer and in-house race car driver Rolf Meldy also raced a 92 in the Monte Carlo Rally in 1950, though didn't achieve the same level of success as Greta. However, he did enter a 92 in the Swedish Rally Championship in 1950 and won it and proceeded to rally race Saab for years to come. Meldy was very active in Saab's motorsport activities in general, including developing the Saab's take on Formula Junior, a Formula racing car meant to serve as a stepping car to professional Grand Prix racing. It mainly served as a test bed for the company's road car technology, as many race cars typically do. But it ran for two seasons in the early 60s and served its purpose well. You did a good job, junior car. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Well done. Now you get to be road car. (laughs) (laughs) Between normal street driving and rally driving, form followed function with a sturdy little 92 and vice versa. A stiff and aerodynamic body structure plus a low curb weight not only made the most of its tiny engine, but also gave great handling on tight technical rally stages all over Europe. Nice. Cool. (laughs) After the 92 came, well, more 92s. (laughs) (laughs) It continued on as the 93 in 1956, 95 station wagon variant in 1958, and the 96 in 1960. So... Earlier, I was talking about the Ursaab yeah. and how it'd be a cool land speed car. Yeah. And that's because when I was at Bonneville, I saw a Saab 93 oh, land speed car. That's so, so cool. It was really cool, really small. And I'm like, that would be terrifying. Yeah. How um, fast did it get? I don't know. Don't recall. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, 
of these three. <laughs> Turns out it's a pretty good idea. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite, Christina? 96 is cool. The, the wagon, wagon is, is sick. Dope. With those wheels? Oh my God. You know, I love a wagon in general. Whoa. So, like, I just like as many windows as possible. Yeah. Always. Mm-hmm. Um, these are cute. Yeah. The reason we say they're 92s is that they all maintain the generally the same chassis, just with increases in wheelbase, interior room, cargo room, doors, and, and then some. The engines were updated along the way too, with two-stroke variants being produced all the way until 1968 and various minor power increases as well. Dude, that's crazy that they were running two-stroke engines in their cars. Yeah. Yeah. Just <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. imagine... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Walking down the street and you're just like, just smoke yeah. everywhere, <laughs> like oily smoke, oily smoke, just covering getting in everything, back end, loud as shit. Well, it's why you see all the photos from cities oh, early on when, yeah. the, like, of course, people were like, "I hate cars." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they well, make the streets. So I think dirty. about that too when, like, you see like a classic, like a muscle car or something yeah. from the yeah. '50s roll by, and you're like, <laughs> yeah. "Yeah, like, oh man, I was stuck behind a uh, '70s Corvette the other day." Yeah. And I, it just like I don't know what to do. It felt like I was being like gassed because it was yeah. just like. But ugh, gross. that was yeah. like almost every car I know. on the road. Can was you producing imagine that amount of, yeah. of smell and emissions and everything? Of course, these days people are like tuning their cars to be pretty rich and all that. But still, mm. yeah. Uh, imagine you're sitting on the street in terrible. Stockholm and it's just like loud and smoky, and you eat so smelly that you can't even smell your sir strumming. Sure. Well, maybe that's why everyone was fine with the fact that they smoke cigarettes constantly. Yeah. It's because all of the, the oh, smell maybe. of the car is notice. covered up. Can't even notice. Guys, yeah. huh. this is the best smelling time period. Yeah. Right we now? All have oh, de- yeah, yeah. We have deodorant. We have colognes. We yeah. take showers. Yeah. We have, we are cleanly. That's true. We have cleanliness. And Although uh, Vikings were very cleanly. Are you sure? Really? They, I mean, yeah, they cl- bathe multiple times a week and they brush their oh, hair. A week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a common misconception about Vikings that they're know, just big, smelly out, guys. You're still living outside. Yeah, I know. And it's probably like animal fat and lye that yeah. you're bathing with. Yeah, I was also going to say they're like, I just picture them on their boat. So I'm like, yeah, I don't know. When you get off a boat, you're kind of gross, though. Yeah, it's true. You're not like. They might have been relatively clean. Yeah. Uh, clean for a, rel- yeah, yeah, compared for to time. like English people who mm. just like kept putting on more layers and more. Mm. Perfume. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. you know what I learned Those about English. New York is like the reason why all the old buildings are like raised. They just along built the on street. the old shit. No, but it's so that because of the shit in the street. Oh. Because <laughs> oh. of all the like horse crap. And oh, like, you're talking about like the brownstones. Yeah, the brownstones yeah. Are, are raised so that rich people wouldn't have to step directly yeah. into. They're literally above it. Yeah. It's wow. literally stepping over poop. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways, from then on, Saab introduced a more common four-stroke Ford V4 with more power. V4 is pretty uncommon. That's very uncommon. A That's big chunk of the OG Saab 92 recipe lived on until 1980 when the final 96 V4 ceased production. That was over 30 years. I love this car. It's a weird-looking little car. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a moment and talk about one area where Saab's always been well-renowned, safety. One interesting piece of engineering that Saab utilized in the 95-96 was a dual diagonal braking system in 1964. What? What? Uh-huh. This allowed the driver to maintain better control under heavy braking by putting diagonal corners on the same line, meaning the front uh. driver brake with the right passenger brake. Okay. Oh, okay. so it's like... Okay. It's like... On opposite sides, but one rod pushes them together. Front driver brake. So they're both going in the same direction, and then the other one goes like that, and it pinches. Mm-hmm. That's pretty crazy. What? This is similar to common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> trying to- look at look oh. at my hands. Okay. These. This is the outside brake pad yeah, on yeah, the yeah. driver's side. Okay. This is the inside brake pad on the passenger side. Okay. When they push together. They're going oh, okay. In. Yeah. I see. I see. Go to YouTube to see that demonstration. Yeah. Okay. And Weird. see my tiny hands. <laughs> <laughs> Big thanks to Liquid IV for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. If you hate drinking water like I do, you're going to love Liquid IV. Whether you hydrate to live or live to hydrate, Liquid IV quenches your thirst faster than water alone. 
If you can't drink water by itself because it doesn't have any flavor, you're in luck because Liquid IV has a bunch of different flavors. My personal favorite is white peach. I don't have to worry about being dehydrated when I come home from baseball. In fact, one stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. It's got three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, and it's got eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness. So however you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco or get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code GAS at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code GAS at liquidiv.com. Big thanks to Indeed for sponsoring this episode of Past Gas. We are driven by a search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. I've done hiring in the past for Donut, and it is a pain in the butt. But if I had a tool like Indeed when I was doing hiring, it would have made things so much easier. Just their matching function is super robust. So join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash past gas. Just go to Indeed.com slash past gas right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash past gas. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. This brake setup is similar to common split circuits today, where some control is maintained if one corner's brake line springs a hydraulic leak. Okay. This shows how early on and ahead of the game Saab was at intuitive safety technology. Yeah. It's Those true. Swedes love their safety. Volvo, also very safe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, if you're driving around in icy conditions all the time, you want your cars to be safe, right? Yeah, for sure. I guess that would probably motivate you. I also yeah. want my cars to be safe in deserts. Yeah. So, I'm just naming another land. I <laughs> want my car to be <laughs> that's not really specific. safe during midsummer celebration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah you got to get out of there before they sew you into a bear. No, they just gave us this tea. It tastes really good. I no, feel Joe, good. I told you. <laughs> but let's change gears to one of the best models ever, which really cemented Saab as a brand for people who think outside the box. The nine nine. Hitting dealerships in 1968, this thing was gorgeous, okay? With mm-hmm. spacious yet sporty <laughs> two-door dimensions, the overall shape and profile was designed with aerodynamics in mind. That cool, unique-looking hatchback rend was based on science, people. Let me describe it to you in more detail. Okay. I mean, it, yeah, it's very car-like. This, this car. reminds me of my grandparents. Really? Do they have one? I don't know. I, I just, like, have a very visceral, like... It really, I'm, I can see it driving past the hedges of where they lived. You Maybe know what they I mean? Did. Saab also made the 99 quite structurally rigid for safety. The front A pillars are uh, relatively massive. They look very skinny in this picture. <laughs> the front end extends pretty far forward to allow more real estate between the driver and the car ahead, with the glass moved forward to clear head movement in the event of a crash. You That's know what are safe. actually big on this? The D pillars. The D pillars are quite. Normally, big. you don't get a D pillar on a car, but this one has prominent D pillars. Mm. It should, yes, it does. Yeah. So these safety changes also benefited overall visibility. Speaking of which, the dashboard and instrument cluster were designed in a wraparound fashion that made them easy to see while driving along, which was inspired from plane design as well. Mm. Oh, Made from jets. Born from, from jets. Born from. Born different. Born Bjorn from jets. Bad. Built different. Built tough. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Not that Lady Gaga. Born this way. Yeah. <laughs> the 99 was also front wheel drive, making around 86 horsepower from a one and a half liter inline four start. It had a four speed manual transmission and reached 60 miles per hour in about 14 seconds. 14 seconds isn't exactly fast by today's standards. Uh, at all, but it was a bit sprightly for its day. Yeah, and that's why Christina's not doing the, I was gonna say. <laughs> the employee drag race that we're going to make a video on. It's got a 2001 Forester. As I was, <laughs> 2000 actually, yeah. as I was right editing this, I was like, that's not that slow. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, that's just me getting on the highway. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and interestingly, okay, guys, 
The engine was one half of a V8 from British manufacturer Triumph. Whoa. All that structural rigidity translated to excellent handling. So once again, the 99 found its way into motorsports all over the globe, including its win at the 1976 Rally Boucle de Spa in Belgium, thanks to its 220 horsepower and rally legend Stig Blankfist. Nice pronunciation, dude. Mm-hmm. Besides intuitive form follows function, safety, and styling, the 99 was giving a major upgrade in 1978. I'm talking a turbocharger. While this was the 99's final year, it was one to remember, as it was the first mass market turbocharged car available. That's right. Sure, there was the Porsche 911 Turbo, aka the 930, that debuted in 1976. But that and a couple of other sporty offerings were low-production, high-priced machinery. This was a much more attainable and modest, friend, family-friendly four-seater. So not quite the, f- I guess, mass market. Porsches are mass market too, though. Also, there was a Buick in the late '60s that had a turbo. I'm pretty sure. Oh. That's that's mass market. Hmm. Saab's main reasoning for turbocharging was that it could give drivers added oomph around town, yet maintain a small two-liter displacement for overall efficiency. It produced 130 horsepower and about 160 foot-pounds of torque and reached 60 in 8.5 seconds. Talk about an upgrade. (laughs) (laughs) And it wasn't even necessarily meant to be the first successful turbocharged sport compact either. But that's what it was. Reception of its newfound forced induction was overall quite positive, guys. And the added low-end grunt was a welcome addition to the 99's already fun-to-drive personality. And while some cars get uglier as they're upgraded over time, whether by bloated proportions or questionable style changes, the 99 just got prettier and prettier until its production ended in 1984. I do want to say a 2-liter turbocharged engine making 130 horsepower in the 70s, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. That'd be a fun car to drive. I assume. I assume so. Yeah. I love the way these cars look. Like, I just turned my laptop to be like, Joe, did you see the <laughs> the last one? And I think I messaged you about these, mm-hmm. too. I was and like, I immediately found you one. Yeah. Which was, they were like, the seats are broken. <laughs> and yeah. Everything that's is any four, 50 year old car, you're going to have to do some stuff like that. I know. The seat on my Z is starting to fall through. And Already? I mean, this 40 year old. It's like 215,000 miles it's got. Yeah. It's 40 years old. It's going to happen. Yeah. The springs just wear out. The, the fabric wears out. You just farted too much on it. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> did blow out my ass too. Yeah. You're farting through your, your seat? Yeah. You don't. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I, I wait until I get out of my car to fart. Are you <laughs> kidding me? <laughs> Let's take a second and discuss another big component of sob enthusiasm. It's owners. Mm -hmm. In the U.S. market, they've always been stereotyped and market researching backs this as highbrow individuals. Highly educated and often left-leaning folks who work in academia, the sciences, architecture, dentistry, the ad industry, Hmm. you name it. That's a lot of different industries. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't really paint a picture of uh, a Saab driver. Dude, architecture and dentists are the same thing. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. You're basically Dentists. just like setting the blueprints for I someone's was mouth. I say they're architects of the mouth. Yeah. <laughs> so base, I guess they are the same. They're architects yeah. of the mouth. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> dentists. And you know what? You just you just sold uh, dentists in a new way, which makes you part of the ad industry. Oh. oh I kind of am. Yeah. Yeah. You are. You are kind of part of the ad industry. Shill. Well, I carry a lot of water for a lot of these automotive brands on this channel. So. Yeah. <laughs> but also... Comedians oh. lo- enjoy sobs. We're talking yeah. Jerry Seinfeld. Yep. That's it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. He had a sob in the show. But he had a few yeah. different cars, didn't he? Yeah, but the, the one show. that, like, I, I'm pretty sure the one that Putty or his crazy mechanic stole was the sob. It was. Yeah. No. Yeah. With the golf clubs in the back, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Uh, JFK's golf clubs. <laughs> yes. I fall asleep watching Seinfeld. So oh, okay. <laughs> I'm very... <laughs> is that when he is that when Putty there. steals his move as well, steals his car and his move? No, it wasn't it wasn't Putty, it was the brother from Everybody Loves Raymond. Oh doing a oh, bit. Brad part. Garrett. Yes, Brad Garrett was what? his yeah, no, Putty wasn't ever the weird jealous mechanic. It was oh. a new mechanic he was trying oh. out. Oh, that's right, that's right. That's and right. I believe it's because Putty did steal his move. Okay. But oh. I yeah, actually right. I can't confirm that part. I think well, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Again, it's all in there. Yeah. Wow. 
All right. So safety, efficiency, intuitive design, thinking outside the box, they definitely go hand in hand. Oh, yeah, definitely. Before we move into the next <laughs> model, though, let's talk about smart advertising, which Saab has always been very good at. One particular ad for the U.S. market, 99, in 1975, sums up the brand with one line. We'd like you to test drive our last car. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Did I say that wrong? Our car last. Uh, <laughs> I was like, that's still pretty... That'd be gnarly if it, they said that. That's pretty yeah. cool because like if <laughs> like if it's out of date and it's still a great car, then you're gonna want to buy the new one. Anyways, that's my pitch for Saab if you're <laughs> All right. You just didn't know. I'm sorry. That was really uh, funny. <laughs> one particular ad for the US market 99 and 75 sums up the brand with one line. We'd like you to test drive our last Oh my god. <laughs> Why can't I say this? We'd like you to test drive our car last, meaning there you go. that, you know, uh, if you're dying. test driving a bunch of different cars, they want you to do theirs last because you're going to pick theirs. This implies that the 99 possesses all the best aspects of its competition and affirms that it matches Volvo in durability, Audi in luxury, BMW in performance, VW in economy, Peugeot in ride quality, and Mercedes in overall quality. That's a lot to infer from that that one line. Though. Yeah, I don't know if I get. It. I don't know if I'd get it. I'd be like, Yeah, what? Would they they want to test drive their last car. <laughs> <laughs> this is our last car yeah. right now. Basically, it respectfully dunks on its competition. Oh, not many brands have ever been good at that. I think VW does a good job. Yeah, they do a great job. Uh, they're faster than a Porsche ad from the '60s or whatever. That was funny. The next model to debut was the 900, which is my favorite, in 1978, which lasted all the way up until 1998, so when good. its final iteration slash second generation. Oh, yeah, these things are sweet, actually. Oof. Jesse had one of these things. Yeah. Yeah. He had, he, he had multiple. He had the, no, he had multiple Sabarus. Oh, Sabarus. He has, still oh, has his, his 900, Sabaru. though. Are we going to talk about Sabaru in the next episode? We sure are. Yes. A little bit. Okay. I would re redact my earlier statement that Sabaru is my favorite. Oh, oh, yes. Okay. The 900 largely followed the same schematic as the 99 because, well, it was largely the same car. Oh. A lot of the panels were the same, as was the rear glass. They were even made at the same time for a while, until 1984. But it's not like the platform was stale because updates were made along the way. The front end was stretched out a bit to increase crash safety and interior accoutrements. Ooh. <laughs> accoutrements? And interior accoutrements were added here and there to maintain its luxury automaker status. Oh, so that's how you spell that. Accoutrement. <laughs> <laughs> accoutrement. Can you some of that charcuterie on accoutrement? Oh, I guess, I guess accoutrements. <laughs> accoutrements is how you say it in American. What? Whereas the R-E would be the British spelling. Uh, that's what I thought it was. Accoutrements. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta replace my accoutrements on my side. <laughs> You need to get some accoutrements and some whores Whores of whores. Charcuchis. <laughs> whores de <rovers. laughs> Guys, I'm going to what France this week. Oh, yeah, yeah, you are. You are. It hurts me to mispronounce these. <laughs> yes. It's okay. i doing my Duolingo. Yeah. Have you figured out how to say anything like particularly existential? Because I found that the French one, it goes real dark with the Duolingo. Because I was like freshing it up on mine, freshening up on mine. Oh no, it's catching. No, I've, <laughs> ma I've mainly been like, can I have 40 oranges? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. Everybody speaks English over there. It'll be fine. Oh, you've been there? To France? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you went to Monte Carlo. Well, I was in, we were in the south of France, but like everybody okay. speaks cool. English there. They're not going to be happy about it. They're going to let you know. They also don't like it when you speak French because I can speak exactly. French. Exactly. Exactly. Really? And they get, they're very impatient. Yeah. Like you can try. They you're appreciate like sounding it. shit out. You're uh, you probably sound like a toddler to them. Also, not all French people are the same. Blah. But like, yeah, when you, you try to do it, they interrupt you and they go English. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They have uh, no patience. Exactly. Just Italians, say Italians, Just Italians like, are like so engaged, interested when you try. Yeah. They're like, huh, look yeah. at you go. <laughs> I'm mid ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just say bonjour. Uh, and then Merci. they go English, and you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll know. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm gonna be wearing my Timberlands and my Patriots jersey. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was gonna say your fanny know. pack yeah. will give you away yeah. for sure. <laughs> Make sure to bring that Steve Nash jersey with you. <laughs> no, yeah. they love basketball over there. Oh yeah, they, they do. Like that. Oh yeah. But some of the most exciting <laughs> updates were made to its engine. The two-liter engine was turbocharged for pretty much its entire run, hmm. though with some tweaks made to up the power and reliability, such as its turbocharger. Hmm. Revisions were made to its oiling and cooling, and Saab's own automatic performance control was introduced to reduce boost pressure under load via knock sensor. Oh, nice. That's cool. This meant it was less picky about what octane fuel was poured in the tank. So you could put some, you know, 87 in if you want to go crazy. Oh. Put some 87 in. <laughs> what about uh, 89? I guess 87 would be less. You knock. probably should put 91 in a turbocharged yeah, engine, I yeah. think. All right. I sound like an idiot. I also, I, it's okay. The most power <laughs> ever made from the factory was 175 horsepower, which was under the hood of the 900 Turbo S. That looks this pretty is sweet. what I, this, I want this car. Yeah, it's tight. When it comes to thinking outside the box with the 900, Saab couldn't resist pulling off something truly bizarre. The engine was turned around 180 degrees mm -hmm. so that the accessory belts faced the firewall and driver, and the transmission was placed between the engine and the bumper. Yep. That is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you get a fender bender, you're going to have to replace the transmission. Yeah, you're Ooh. Yeah, you're Instead right. Instead of a couple belts and pulleys. <clears throat> hmm. Uh, the transmission was driven off a chain from the engine, and the turbo piping made the exhaust's gas journey quite long before it reached the rear mufflers. Though this not only made clutch servicing easier than other cars, hmm. but also pushed the engine a little further back for improved weight distribution. Hmm. That is pretty pretty in innovative. I'm kind of into that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I kind of, I think I kind of understand it. Also, you could just like copied Honda and just have like a longitudinally mounted engine where you could service the clutch just from the side rather than. Yeah. You know. Was Honda doing this at that point? Not, not like this. This sounds like the entire engine is like. So it's latitudinally. Like the front of the engine is now yeah. pointing to back instead of like having it sideways. Latitude in the engine means bag, it like faces the bag. shape of the car. Yeah. Versus longitude. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It's really interesting. Sure is. Okay. So with three, s man, we didn't even talk about any jets. Because jet. they were all used to kill allies. No, yeah. they still make jets. <laughs> oh, the Gripen. That's a that's a more modern jet. The Gripen, the Saab. Yeah, we should talk about that next one. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> cool plane. So with three, <laughs> with a solid three or so decades in the book, Saab was on a roll with its own unique formula of putting safety and efficiency first, which then translated to distinctive design and fun to drive attitude. I don't even think they had jets in World War II. The Germans did at the very end, but there's yes. only a couple of them yeah. at the very end. But I doubt that the Swedes were making them in World War II yet. Yeah. yeah. I, I love this because uh, there's this meme that like as you get into your 30s, men choose to be really obsessed with World War II or barbecuing. And it's I'm not here. a choice. I'm here with both of you. Well, I've been a- <laughs> It happens. I've got been my barbecue happens. boy. Just like Balding, it just happens. <laughs> yeah. got, well, I was like reading World War II books when I was like yeah. nine years old. Well, that's because you're 85. Did yeah, 56. <laughs> you're yeah. so much older. <laughs> Uh, the trajectory from intuitively modest economy car to sporty design portfolio brilliance with great driving chops was quite an achievement for the humble, small Swedish brand. But from 1985 and on, things would start to look a lot different. Challenges arose, whether rooted in the world economy, partnerships with other brands, or changing ownership. Saab was in for one heck of a ride. And while many consider the 80s to be one of Saab's prime eras, it also marked the beginning of the brand's gradual downfall. Between some early co-development headaches, a gradual increase in platform sharing as General Motors gained more and more ownership in the brand, things were on an ever so slight downslope. To make matters worse, a few economic downturns between the late 80s and late 2000s made earning money tough for a brand that didn't have the same scale of production as its European competitors like VW, BMW, Mercedes-Benz, and other smaller firms. So we'll see how that ends up next time on Pass Gas with part two, the finale of Saab. That has two meanings too. That's almost a, that's a pun as well. What? What? The finale of Saab. Not just talking about the I know. our series finale, but it the was, end of the brand itself. Yeah. When That's a double entendre. I wouldn't That's call that a pun. pun. Yeah, double entendre. Do you want to read the listener mail? Sure. Oh. 
Hey, what's up, guys? I'm Michael from San Jose, California. I love your show. It's Wa hella good. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Watch it every commute or whenever a new one comes out, even old episodes. I was recently listening and I've always wanted to know, what is your outro intro song? Keep your goose juiced with Mopow, baby, <laughs> and keep it winking. Keep much it winking? Much love from the Bay nice. Area. You even combined two of my catchphrases. I also like that it says outro intro instead of intro outro. I think that shows a, a, a special kind of mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, do we, and that's nice. Yeah. Keep it winking, man. Keep uh, winking, man. I, I made the theme song. You did? Uh, in 2019. You sure did. Oh. Uh, when James said, hey, make a song for this podcast. And then he gave me, when he was filming up to speed, he recorded at the end of it, pass gas, pass. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And it was, it was kind of based off of the Wayne's World theme. Yeah, totally. Uh, and you then I just that. put a backing track on it. But the outro song is just a music service we use called Epidemic. It's just all Everybody uses royalty. Epidemic, all the yeah. YouTube yeah. channels out there. I Something I found out in the wheelhouse music episode mm -hmm. uh, I thought that Henry made one of the beats mm -hmm. that uh, it was the CD song I think yeah. or the the plane song yeah. the Learjet guy we've used that epidemic track in like a bunch of wheelhouses yeah. before hmm. that's funny that's so funny well next week we're going to talk about Saab's downfall and hopefully about some cool jets they have one called the the Draken that's a sick yeah. one Draken's a sick jet it's gotta be named after a dragon Right? I think you're correct on that. Cool. Um, yeah, so. Some folklore. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you want to hit us up in the email, hit us up at pascas at donutmedia.com. Follow Christina on social media. Christina Felsky. Christina was with a K. And Joe G. Weber, Nolan J. Sykes. Big thank you to Gavin Kinzel on yeah. the board over there. And our writer, Peter Nelson, this week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Nick Giamuso for setting up these lovely, lovely cameras. We'll yeah. see you next time. Bye.